really, really uh, girls into this class with all this, with all these drinks. So thanks a lot. And I would like to invite uh, Moshe for the first presentation, Moshe Lirik, and then uh, we'll start off the presentation and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, feel free if you want to write down anything, you can approach Moshe later on, hopefully, and ask everything. Uh, thanks a lot. So again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is a great opportunity for me to also thank the Oscar Foundation in general. Um, we know that the past the past two years and a bit were uh, pretty hectic for everyone. So we, we are really appreciating the uh, the actual attendance. This is something that we. We cannot really perceive of how many people will come, so I would like to thank you personally about this. I know it's not always easy, and of course with traffic and everything, Tel Aviv is great with parking in general, uh, so thank you very much for coming. Um, now today we're going to uh, discuss uh, our topic of discussion is uh, Kubernetes API server, which is a very specific uh, component, but a very large one within the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, and I would like to maybe start with uh, some high-level uh, goals of what we are trying to achieve today. But before that, um, I would like to introduce Lili Soko, uh, our greatest and the brightest uh, engineer within the company, uh, the tech lead within Apiro. Uh, she's in charge of 99% of code, I think, and we have like 40 engineers. Um, and, uh, and myself, Chatsioni, VP of Security Research uh, in uh, Apiro. What is our goal today? So our goal is to cover, as we said, the API server component, discuss the Kubernetes ecosystem in general, and approaching the API server sec security specifically, while we know what is the misconceptions about the security within Kubernetes, and also about the API server um, in, in not, not just in general, but also in specific. And lastly, of course, we won't leave you hanging there. We're just going to give you some of the remediation tips about what, what can we do about Kubernetes security, and of course, again, security within API server. Okay, so what is Kubernetes? And as you probably already heard, Kubernetes is a, a general purpose platform for managing containerized workloads and services. That means that it gives you a lot of power to run your application with all kinds of features, including orchestration, scalability, availability, and all lots, lots of stuff, uh, increasing uh, every day. And uh, in order to do that, Kubernetes needs a lot of behind the scenes logic. Uh, it's very complicated to get into every aspect of the Kubernetes architecture. So we're going to give you a little bit of uh, focus on, as we said, the API server and what's around it in order to understand why it's so important and why it has the power that it has. So this is how a uh, Kubernetes clusters do in general. First of all, we have the master, also known as the control plane. Inside the master, we have a couple of uh, components, mainly the API server itself, this is the, the hive mind that actually orchestrates everything around the cluster. It gives the commands, it accepts requests, it sends out data to whatever else needs to be done around the cluster. And it's also scalable, okay? We don't have to have only one master, but in general, we, we will focus uh, on a single instance. Uh, also in the uh, master, the control plane, we have other components like the controller and the scheduler, the responsible for actual, actual replication, meaning we need to know what needs to run when and where, and scheduling, uh, what are our concerns in terms of limitations, resource requests, etc. And we have the ECD, key value store. That's where everything metadata is kept. Everything from your configuration saying how the cluster should look, and everything uh, concerning the runtime, what is actually running, where, and how it looks. 
This means that everything that the API server tells you, it actually takes from the key value store. Anything that is not in the key value store is stuff that are specific to your node, to your runtime, and that are not that is not managed by Kubernetes. That's not a lot because Kubernetes knows a lot. The node. So we have one or more worker nodes. As we said, the master is also running on some machine. It can run on the same machine as the node, but it doesn't have to, it shouldn't. And on the node, we have the actual running application that is starting from the container, running using whatever container runtime you have, probably Docker, maybe container D. And uh, that is managed by a very important component known as Kubelet. Kubelet is what is running on the pod, making requests and accepting requests from the API server to actually run stuff inside the node, inside the, to run the containers themselves. We also have the proxy, which is responsible for net, all the stuff networks. We need to abstract away networks in order for the pods, the containers to be able to communicate with each other. The API server has a lot of resources. As we said, it manages all the stuff in the cluster, and that's a lot of stuff. This is just a taste of the APIs that we have. This means that actually whatever information Kubelet needs or the user needs, they will get from either of these uh, limited APIs that we're showing here. There are much more, and there are many levels. And this means that we have the potential for very granular and focused uh, roles for our API server. We'll get to, onto that later. So focusing on the API server, what is actually uh, accessing it and why? So as we said, the node itself need to access the API server and the API server needs to access the node. They have all sorts of handshakes in order to uh, say the node is ready, the node, the node has problems. The API server is asking the node, can it run more containers? This container should be run on the node, etc. Also, specific containers on the node can make requests to the API server. You probably know it as service accounts. You can define service accounts in, inside Kubernetes and make requests from your containers into the API server. That is done with some token that you are getting from the API server. The kubelet itself is uh, communicating with the API server by a special service account. It's a known service account, which has other and specific uh, authorization, which we also will get into later. The last one, and maybe the most important, is the client. Client is the general term for everything outside the cluster. And it could be kubectl on the developer machine, or it could be anything on the cloud console or any other GUI. This is probably what you will use to access the cluster. When you are running kubectl commands, you are actually communicating with the API server, which fetches stuff from etcd, the key value store, or any other thing that it needs. So the abstractions layers are something like that. We have the code running inside the container, managed by the cluster, and actually running on some uh, cloud infrastructure or machines, uh, bare metal, or whatever you have for your cluster. This means that actually the security of each level makes it compromised for the inner levels. What do I mean? What does that mean? If I have control of the cluster, I have control of all the containers and all of the code. If I have control of the cloud infrastructure, for example, I have full control of the virtual machines that are running the cluster, I virtually can do anything. Um, what, what we would like to discuss next is the, as you heard to, right now about the security architecture within a Kubernetes, uh, there are many misconceptions about this kind of security and also some, I would say, misjudgments about those. So we would like to uh, hone down about uh, for a few things that we, we think are misconcepted and also how to, of course, to think about it again. 
first, uh, this is the, the most important part that uh, everyone are, are pretty confused about. Uh, I won't say everyone, but everyone approaching it for the first time will be confused about because it's, uh, the terminology is a bit obscure sometimes. It's first of all that there are many, many features within Kubernetes that will give you a lot of security. They are. Uh, Kubernetes is ready-made with, with security by design or uh, and also with the features that are top-notch and modern. That said, those features are not always on, especially features that will be a bit surprising for you maybe. But the first example is RBAC or role-based access control. Now, Kubernetes have RBAC. It has the functionality itself, but if you first time you just installed it and you have your new cluster ready-made, you won't have any kind of roles within your uh, organization except the general role that will give you total control. So this is a default installation. And we also have a demo later about what kind of default installations we see in the, in the wild and, and also how to exploit that. So keep that in mind that those kind of features are on, uh, not by default. So you need to opt into those or maybe to augment those in order to actually use them. The second one is, is encryption uh, address. And also we will, we will see that uh, lively on the on the demo that you won't have on many key values and specifically on values from the key value store you won't have encryption just ready made you need to define those kind of encryptions you need to to change something in the configuration in order to have that it's not broken science but also it's not there to begin with so you will have to do some work um, thirdly auditing any kind of logging or in general let me put an asterisk there but logging in general are not are something that is very supported you have a lot of monitoring controls and auditing in terms of security auditing that said you won't have that outside the box you need to turn on those kind of audits to send it somewhere to ingest it somewhere and maybe uh, and of course further down the line maybe you have your sim or your soft you would like to ingest that but even without it just to read the logs won't be able to do so so you will have to uh, opt in into logging and auditing for security controls lastly on this list is network isolation once you have your pods or, or namespaces or uh, nodes you won't have any built-in seg segmentations apart of nodes themselves and the master itself that they have some kind of a, a segmentation especially on cloud uh, installations but except that many are, uh, are in a big surprise once you, they are opening their uh, cluster, multi-node cluster, and they figure out that the pod itself can talk to all of the nodes all together just by default. And this is a false premise. You won't have that out of the box, but you can also uh, hone down on network controls in order to do so. We're going to talk about it in the remediation steps. Uh, also on um, Kubernetes security misconceptions is first of all, you have a multi-layered architecture, but as Leary showed you the beautiful graph, by the way, this is a original, very beautiful graphic by Kubernetes themselves um, that, the, that really employs the, the notion that if you have those kind of uh, circles or onion-like uh, security, what we used to see in security is those kind of onion uh, layers, and by that you have more security. In this term, once you have the bridge, the first layer, you actually, as Leary said, bridging the whole system altogether unless you are doing something uh, not out of, out of the box. Uh, and lastly on this list is uh, that the, keep in mind that it's, it's centralized, meaning that you have a lot of control over the API server specifically, and, the, and then we come to the real, uh, um, the greatest uh, notion of this component of API server, that it is centralized, it's a feature of full uh, um, server that gives you a lot of opportunities to, to have those kind of features employed. That said, putting everything on a single point of uh, failure, this is of course, not something that we are used to in the last 10 years at least um so again it's not it's not more of a it's not like a uh ranting about kubernetes but in general just keep that in mind that you still have those kind of designs uh by definition and you will need to fight that or need to adjust that to your specific cases and needs and uh, keeping up from that um i went on to review 2021 cbes um those kind of vulnerabilities that are being published uh, over Kubernetes. So the great thing about Kubernetes is that it has many, uh, 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 very little uh, known public uh, CVEs, and that's a great thing. That, that means that in general, Kubernetes was built or uh, was built by engineers that knew about security, that knows about, about what, what they are doing, and six overall in 2021, even if we are counting those that have been uh, shifted off uh, into 21 from 2020, six CVEs for such a great uh, architecture is very few CVEs. And all of those CVEs 
are medium to low level if you are counting the CVSS score of those kind of CVEs. So off the bat, this is a great record for Kubernetes. That said, if you are looking into the CVEs themselves, we'll look at at least four. I'm saying that, as I said, that there is a total of six CVEs, even if we are counting those that have been shifted from 2020. And those six, for at least four of them, are API server focused. The other two, one is on the host to guest um, sub path and how do you how can you actually infiltrate some of the data that we have on host to guest which is kind of part of the deal when you are looking at kubernetes and the second and the last one is something that is a mix between the two worlds so in general we have a theme here and and i guess you picked it up by by, uh, by now that the theme is kpi service uh, api server specifically is of course a very uh, large culprit that we would like to we would like to uh, know more about and also to be more focused about than intended once we are trying to uh, focus on security for this kind of thing. Uh, maybe one last thing about that, the last one that you see there, it's not that new. Uh, it was uh, published around July, but it's still not fixed, but there is a mitigation. So if you are running Kubernetes right now and you see there is no fix, don't be startled you can still fix it by yourself pretty easy that said it's not something that it's built in into kubernetes and as far as i know as far as far as i can tell from the github issue there is no release date for this fix um, so if you have that uh, go ahead and read that so we'll move on to a short demo uh, what we're going to show you is how we can access uh, cluster secrets using only access to one of the worker nodes. We're going to use a, machine, a cluster uh, run on uh, Google. So it's a cloud managed cluster. Uh, by default and by any configuration that I saw, you cannot access the master instance in the Google managed uh, Kubernetes. That's very good because, as we said, once you're in the master, you have everything under your control, but still you have access to the worker nodes. And uh, worker nodes also have some power. That's what we're going to show. So our first step would be to actually get inside the node without any permissions besides uh, the, the root access to the file system. So we are not authenticated against Google or any other service. We're going to do a bit of reconnaissance by taking a look on how Kubelet is run on the node. It's running natively as a process on the node. Uh, we're going to dig up a couple of stuff from its configuration, uh, the API server details, and the Kubelet client certificate. The client certificate is what Kubelet is using to authenticate against the API server. Uh, as we said earlier, the node has a special authorization that allows it to access uh, certain uh, APIs. For example, you can freely access APIs uh, to fetch uh, uh, nodes data and uh, pods data, even stuff that are not related to your node, but specifically uh, secrets. You can access any secrets that has any relationship with your node. So for example, if any pod is running on this node and has uh, secrets in its manifest, Although you cannot access secrets uh, by themselves without knowing it, if you have the pod, you can access them. We'll see that in a bit. So after we have uh, achieved uh, getting the configuration, we are going to show a couple of commands using CURL. Uh, that's the uh, easiest part. But the nicer part is using kubectl. kubectl is actually leveraging CRL behind the scenes, not CRL itself, but the same uh, HTTP request that we are going to show with, CR, with the CRL, with the client-side certificates. Uh, kubectl is just a bit more friendly and will allow us to do it nicer. We're going to do, again, a bit of reconnaissance to get which pods are running on our node so that we can uh, see which secrets in relationship with our node. And once we know which secrets we want to target, we're going to actually get the secret data and from there can do whatever we want. So, hope you can see that. So first we're logging into the machine. 
we're using PS to actually get the data about kubelets, looking at kubelets class, and we're seeing the path to cube config where the cluster data is saved, and namely the API server. The IP is publicly accessible. That's what you are using when you're using kubectl locally. And so we're saving that. We have the client, the CI certificate that the cluster uh, gave us. And we also have the certificates there where the kubelet client side certificates are stored. So we're going to need all of these in order to make our request against the API server. We're going to use CURL to actually fetch the list of nodes in the namespace, sorry, in the cluster. Using again the CI certificate, the certificate, the client side certificate and keys, which were given to us by the API server when the node started up and were saved in the file system. Now let's try to do something more specific and try to get all of the secrets in the default namespace. So this failed on uh, forbidden. We are getting the error no object name found. So this cryptic error actually means that we need to request a secret by its name. We can't just get all of the secrets because the API server is enforcing a secret relationship with the node. So now we're moving to use kubectl because it's nicer to show, but again, it's exactly the same. We're going to get all of the parts that are associated with our node using the node name selector. So we're seeing a bunch of parts here and specifically one with an interesting name and we're going to describe it in order to find the secret name that is probably stored in its manifest. And we can see that indeed uh, the pod is mounting a specific secret called app secret. And now we can actually request this specific secret from the API server, and we're going to get it because uh, our node has a relationship with this secret. The secret is encoded in base 64. So we need to decode it in order to get the actual magic value. And we got manual password. So um, what can we do about it? There is the shorter answer that uh, mostly I will give you off the, off the bat. That, that's an option I won't recommend. It's of course a joke, you don't need to run anywhere. Uh, but there are, there are several things that we can do in order to uh, better our positions within security for Kubernetes. Um, and part of it is also was covered before, but now we'll let's uh, just uh, make those points out uh, specifically. <clears throat> So first of all, better our back or again, role-based access controls over the network segmentations that you have. Uh, those kind of set of permissions can be set within network policy, for example, it can be set by our back itself, like roles that are being defined within the Kubernetes cluster. And by that, you can define what kind of um, options or features or permissions those kind of roles will have. Uh, second, on the same term of RBAC, but you can also, also designate what kind of data can be accessed by which role. So you, don't, you are not confined to just networking and uh, access control in terms of uh, authorization to a specific maybe um, uh, um, system, but you can also designate what kind of data, metadata on ETCD can be accessed by whom. Um, uh, one thing we, we also saw here that uh, and we uh, we mentioned it before that as you saw the default is that is being encoded the secrets are being encoded by space 64. This is of course I won't say even bad it's not not a security practice to encode everything uh, in base 64 it's just a uh, encoding scheme. Uh, so encrypting it is is uh, absolutely doable by Kubernetes, but you need to define it within the system and you should do. 
Um, now, also one part of the demo focused on the cube config, which gives you a lot of information about where things are at. It's not the only way to get there, but it, but it is something that attackers are looking for in order to get this kind of reconnaissance. Uh, so controlling the cube uh, config specifically and giving permissions just to those that need to read it, this is also a good practice. Um, and um, one before the last, admission control webhook. We haven't mentioned it yet, and I don't want to dwell into that too much, but there are several uh, webhook configurations for Kubernetes. One of them is admission control, which is a uh, webhook that uh, are being employed over APIs. For example, those kind of APIs are in charge of creating a, uh, a cluster or anything that you can think of in terms of operations for um, uh, Kubernetes, you can also employ active webhooks on them and by that employ your kind of validation, mutation, and in this case, any kind of control that you'd like to have on the API. It's a bit more constructed way to do things, but it is a very standard way for Kubernetes. So you find it uh, very quickly once you are going to, to dwell into how can I uh, <clears throat> employ this kind of validation over the API that we have this is all, and also uh, an alternative, and it's also I won't say the only option, but it's a very, a very uh, static option for if you have a custom defined APIs, what's called a custom resource definition. Uh, if you have those in your Kubernetes, uh, webhooks are also uh, very recommended. Um, and, and and we said before to enforce the network policy. Uh, this is a thing, and tell us all the things, which means not just as a uh, as a rule of thumb, which is also great. But also you have those kind of, uh, of options to um, encrypt those kind of transmissions. So not just data in store, but also in uh, transit. Uh, so you can, for example, in, in this example, we have from API server to the uh, ETCD, even if it's under the same management system, but then you are also transmitting those under TLS. Same goes to the kubelet itself. So the kubelet uh, API server to the kubelet can also be transferred in TLS by definition. This is this is a default, by the way, for the kubelets. That said, there is an, uh, a specific port that is being opened by default, which you should do, uh, should shut it down. And the option is insecure port is a very common practice as, as well. Once you have a Kubernetes cluster uh, on your uh, on your hands uh, and you don't need this kind of kind of local host that gives you access without the TLS. Um, now, honorable mention of what you can see below is the uh, PSP, which is the pod security. Uh, policy, which is something that is still currently uh, employed by Kubernetes. I won't speak about it too much because it's being just being deprecated uh, a few weeks from now, uh, and it's being it's not it's, there is no real alternative to it for the pod security policy. You can you can understand by the name that they, it, it actually a policy a YAML policy, <clears throat> policy that gives you uh, the operations for uh, by pod specific. Uh, to have a security policy for it, this is uh, by definition, but it's being deprecated because it's it's it wasn't it wasn't well uh, received by the community, so it's being deprecated, but without a real alternative. There are several alternatives by the community, so keep an eye on Kubernetes SIG specifically. This is the most uh, active one in terms of how can we replace PSP, uh, the uh, security policy. But this this is less of a recommendation than just keep an eye on because this is something we can cover. There is no, uh, there, there is a lot of data, but no standards yet. So I'm not recommending. I'm saying just keep an eye on that because it, it will be part of the, any kind of standard we will we'll come up with in the future. Thank you very much. Any questions? Do we have time for questions? Oz? Do we have time for questions? Questions? The question was, where does the secret store? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, where is the encryption key? Yeah. 